everybody, welcome back. We're reading the American Indian Myths and Legends book. It's been super hilarious, informative, just astounding. I love it. We are reading a story from the Modoc tribe, and it's titled, People Brought in a Basket. Because so many California tribes were shattered so early by contact with Europeans, decimated by disease, and displaced from their traditional lands, many of their stories have been recorded only as fragments, and it is often difficult to attribute some to specific tribes. We can only note the general region of origin. So, origin of the Modocs? Okay, let's see. I don't know if the Modocs would call themselves a tribe or a region. Kamush, old man of the ancients, went down with his daughter to the underworld of the spirits. It was a beautiful world, reached by one long steep road. In it were many spirits, as many as all the stars in the sky and all the hairs on the animals in the world. When night came, the spirits gathered in a great plain to sing and dance. When daylight came, they returned to their places and the house lay down and became like dry bones. After six days and six nights in the land of the spirits, Kamush longed for the sun. He decided to return to the upper world and to make some of the spirits with him to people his world. With a big basket in hand, he went through the house of the spirits and chose the bones he wished to take. This is gonna basket you just coming with me. Just coming with me. <laughs> Some bones he thought would be good for one tribe of people and others for another. When he had filled his basket, Kumush strapped it to his back and together with his daughter started up the steep road to the upper world. Near the top he slipped and stumbled and the basket fell to the ground. At once the bones became spirits again, shouting and singing. They ran back to their house in the spirit world, lay down, and became dry bones. A second time, Kumush filled his basket with bones and started toward the upper world. A second time, he slipped, and the spirits, shouting and singing, returned to the underground world. A third time, he filled his basket with bones. This time, he spoke to them angrily. You just think you want to stay here when you see my land. A land where the sun shines, you'll never want to come back to this place. There are no people up here, and I know I'll get lonesome again. Aww, is he getting lonesome? A third time, Kamush and his daughter started up the steep and slippery road with the basket. When he came near the edge of the upper world, he threw the basket ahead of him onto level ground. Indian bones, he called out. Then he uncovered the basket and selected the bones for the kinds of Indians he wanted in certain places. That is so cool. He's like, Ugh. as he threw them, he named them, you shall be Shastas. He said to the bones he threw westward, you shall be brave warriors. You also shall be brave warriors, he said to the Pitt River Indians and the Warm Spring Indians. To the bones he threw a short distance northward, he said, you shall be the Klamath Indians. You'll be as easy to frighten as women are. <laughs> what? Not all women get so scared so easy. You won't be good warriors. <laughs> what? <laughs> Imagine telling a people. I was like, okay, I made you, but you're going to be easily frightened and you're not going to be good at fighting. So <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> Sense of humor. Last of all, he threw the bones which became the Modoc Indians. To them, he said, you will be the bravest of all. You will be my chosen people. Though you will be a small tribe and though your enemies are many, you will kill all who come against you. You kill keep my place when I have gone. I, Kamush, have spoken. To all the people created from the bones of the spirits, Kamush said, you must send certain men to the mountains. There they must ask to be made brave or to be made wise. Think about that. A lot of the Mayans too with their mountains, man. Changes you, right? Going into the mountains. There, if they ask for it, they will be given the power to help themselves 
and to help all of you. Then Kamush named the different kinds of fish and beasts that the people should eat. As he spoke their names, they appeared in the rivers and lakes. On the plains and in the forests, he named the roots and the berries and the plants that the people should eat. He thought and they appeared. He thought and they appeared. It's like, he exists. He divided the work of the people by making his law. Men shall fish and hunt and fight. Women shall get wood and water, gather berries, and dig roots, and cook for their families. This is my law. So Kamush finished the upper world and his work in it. Then with his daughter, he went to the place where the sun rises. At the eastern edge of the world, he traveled along the sun's road until he reached the middle of the sky. There he built a house for himself and his daughter. They lived, there they live even today. Reported by Ella Clark in 1953. Ah! <laughs> Kamush, I know that there's so many people now who would get so pissed off if there's g these gender roles, which is pretty ironic, which is fine. I see nothing wrong with men and women having different roles. And I do understand that certain people will switch roles. But it is interesting, right? <laughs> so the next story is from the Cheyenne tribe. And this story is titled, Great Medicine Makes a Beautiful Country. Well, I'll tell that to people who want to deny us healthcare. In this epic tale, a number of different incidents in Cheyenne history from the last 400 years are all merged into a single account of a tribe's evolution told in terms of great migrations, tragic losses, and natural disasters. In the beginning, the great medicine created the earth, and the waters upon the earth, and the sun, moon, and stars. Then he made a beautiful country to spring up in the far north. There were no winters with ice and snow and bitter cold, it was always spring. Wild fruits and berries grew everywhere, and trees shaded the streams of clear water that flowed through the land. In this beautiful country, the great medicine put animals, birds, insects, and fish of all kinds. Then he created human beings to live with the other creatures. Notice how they say, live with. Every animal, big and small, every bird, big and small, every fish, and every insect could talk to the people and understand them. The people could understand each other, for they had a common language and lived in friendship. They went naked and fed on honey and wild fruits. They were never hungry. They wandered everywhere among the wild animals. And when night came and they were weary, they lay down on the cool grass and slept. During the days they talked with the other animals. For they were all friends. The Great Spirit created three kinds of human beings. Okay, let's see which one he created. First, those who had hair all over their bodies. <laughs> like a like a lot of Greeks and a... You know, who else? Oh, man. I don't remember which ones. But they call them bears sometimes. He's a bear man. He's all hairy. Second white men who had hair all over their heads and faces and on their legs. Third, red men who had very long hair on their heads only. That's true, you don't see a lot of Native Americans with beards. That's a good point. <laughs> the hairy people were strong and active, yeah, like mountain men. The white people with the long beards were in a class with the wolf, like the Viking pagans maybe, yeah. For both were the trickiest and most cunning creatures in that beautiful world. The red people were good runners, agile and swift, whom the great medicine man taught to catch and eat fish at a time when none of the other people knew about eating meat. After a while, the hairy people left the north country and went south, where all the land was barren. Then the red people prepared to follow the hairy people into the south. Before they left the beautiful land, however, the great medicine called them together. On this occasion, the first time the red people had all assembled in one place, the great medicine blessed them and gave them some medicine spirit to awaken their dormant minds. Notice, gave them some medicine spirit to awaken their dormant minds. 
From that time on, they seem to possess intelligence and know what to do. The great medicine singled out one of the men and told him to teach his people to band together. Look at that. So the great medicine told teaching the help to like they want the people to band together not just be isolated atoms so that they all could work and clothe their naked bodies with skins of panther and bear and deer the great medicine gave them the power to hew and shape flint and other stones into any shape they wanted into arrow and spearheads and into cups pots and axes that's interesting so the great medicine to them right they're you know god gave them that crafting ability it is something very unique to humans that you know our thumbs we can craft better than monkeys uh, at least for now that is the red people stayed together afterwards they left the beautiful country and went southward in the same direction the hairy people had taken the hairy people remained naked but the red people clothed themselves because the great medicine had told them to. When the red men arrived in the south, they found that the hairy people had scattered and made homes inside of the hills and in caves high up in the mountains. They seldom saw the hairy men, for the hairy ones were afraid and went inside their caves when the red men came. The hairy people had pottery and flint tools like those of the red men, and in their caves they slept on beds made out of leaves and skins. For some reason, they decreased in numbers until they finally disappeared entirely, and today the red men cannot tell what became of them. After the red men had lived in the south for some time, the great medicine told them to return north, for the barren southland was going to be flooded. When they went back to that beautiful northern land, they found that the white-skinned, long-bearded men and some of the wild animals were gone. They were no longer able to talk to the animals, but this time they controlled all of the creatures. Huh. So they were able to have some type of control over different, you know, different critters, but they lost the communication ability. That's interesting. And they taught the panther, the bear, and the similar beast to catch game for them. Oh, <laughs> that must have been helpful. They increased in numbers and became tall and strong and active. Then, for a second time, the red people left the beautiful land to go south. The waters had gone, grass and trees had grown, and the country had become as beautiful as the north. While they were living there, however, another flood swept over the land and scattered the red men. When the great waters at last sank and the ground was dry, the red people did not come together again. They traveled in small bands just as they had done in the beginning before the great medicine told them to unite. The flood destroyed almost everything, and they were on the point of starvation. So they started back to their original home in the north, as they had done before. But when they reached the north county this time, they found the land all barren. There were no trees, no living animals, not a fish in the water. When the red people looked upon their once beautiful home, the men cried aloud, and all the women and children wept. Look at that, they're sad that, you know, their nature is being destroyed. Today, we destroy nature so we can sell it off to make corporations. This happened in the beginning when the great medicine created us. The people returned to the south and lived as well as they could in some years better and others worse. After many hundreds of years, just before the winter season came, the earth shook and the hills, the high hills, sent forth fire and smoke. During that winter, there were great floods. The people had to dress in furs and live in caves, for the winter was long and cold. It destroyed all the trees, though when spring came there was a new growth. The red man suffered much and were almost famished when the great medicine took pity on them. He gave them corn to plant and buffalo for meat, and from that time there were no more floods and no more famines. The people continued to live in the south, and they grew and increased. There were many different bands with different languages, for the red men were never united after the second flood. The descendants of the original Cheyenne had men among them who were magicians with supernatural wisdom. Interesting, their magicians have wisdom, and not, they're not just focused on trickery. Interesting. They charm not only their own people, but also the animals that they lived on. <laughs> That's crazy. No matter how fierce or wild the beasts, became so tame 
that people could go up to it and handle it. This magic knowledge was handed down from the original Cheyenne who came far north today. Bushy Heads is the only one who is, understands the ancient ceremony, and the Cheyenne consider him in an equal rank to the medicine arrow keeper and his assistants. Based on George A. Dorsey's account in 1905. <sighs> that is amazing. Oh, I love it. Love it. That's so cool. They get, you know, this animal taming. That's why the dog is, you know, quite an astounding animal. It'll be loyal to you for as long as it can. So sad that people abuse those dogs. <laughs> the hairy people. <laughs>